So I look back at that Pharisee. Oh, I saw, yeah, I did it. For every mountain. I just started seeing my mountains and so I'm It's taking everything in my power not to run around this church because I see my mountains. And... But there's an assignment today and I ask God it's a blessing to shut my mouth because I really want to holler right now. I just want to holler. They said my brother had cancer and they found it early enough and they got it, so I'm... And the same God that is healing him is healing us today and I'm, I'm really, 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 really excited about the swag that Jesus got because when I think about what he's done, and how he woke me up and how I got food and how I got clothes and I got a little bit of money to pay my bills and I got a church I can come and holler, hallelujah. But there is an assignment, y'all. Don't get me kicked out. Don't mess, don't mess me up. I'm trying to maintain, but it's something about God. It's something about how he does what he does, when he does it, and where he does it, and why he does it. And so, we are grateful. Come on and pray. God, we thank you. Good morning, God. You're so beautiful, you're so awesome, and you're so majestic and so amazing that sometimes we can't even contain our emotions because we start thinking and we start experiencing and the pains and the hurts are all washed away just because of who you are. So we thank you for you. We thank you for the opportunity to serve. We live in a country we can come to church and just bless you. We don't take this privilege lightly. So now, God, let the message come forth. Remove the messenger to see the master today. We love you and we trust you with this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I just want to first thank my pastor who, in his absence, has given us the opportunity to hear the word today. I thank you, sir, if you're watching. Get a new football team. I'm worried about this Cowboys thing. I'm worried about that. <laughs> Outside of that, he's my, he's, amen. Y'all pray for him. And to my family who's here, my family came all the way from Jersey and the Poconos. I got Lions sisters, I got Link sisters, I got friends from work, I've got brothers and sisters here. I thank you for traveling and for those that are online. Thank you so much for all the messages. But there is a word from God this morning. If you will stand with me and turn to Mark chapter 2 in the New International Version. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And it reads as follows. A few days later, when Jesus again entered into Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. 
But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. Oh, this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Just for a few minutes, I want to preach for them subject, by any means necessary. <laughs> by any means necessary. As a child, I grew up mesmerized by the civil rights movement. The first time I heard Julian Bond's voice over the eyes on the prize documentary, I was in. I recall my godfather allowing this nine-year-old little girl to see some of the most gruesome images of our history. I saw Emmett Till's mutilated face and fire hoses and dogs biting at children that looked just like me. And it piqued my curiosity and I would watch intently and I found myself really struck by the martyrs and the champions of the movement. For some, your heroine might be Mamie Till, who was the mother of Emmett Till. She was the woman who said, let the world see what they did to my baby. And for some of you, it might be Rosa Parks, who decided, I'm not sitting in the back of the bus today. And if you knew your history, you would know that was a plan by the NAACP. And for some of you, it's Megger Evers, the assassinated civil rights worker, who was killed in front of his family because he wanted people to vote in Mississippi. And for the vast majority of Americans, your hero was Dr. King because he had such an eloquent ability to speak the words of a dream and use nonviolence as a direct action to change America. But for me, the Camden girl, I gravitated to a voice of a criminal, the son of a Baptist preacher converted to Islam. You know him as Malcolm X. Spike Lee's depiction in 1992 did us a favor when he chose that blessing from God, Denzel. <laughs> sorry, honey, I'm sorry, honey. I, it's my husband, that's my husband, I promise. Hey, Denzel. To chronicle the life of Brother Malcolm, I, he was a man whose words pierced every ear that heard them. And this biographical work of art on the screen changed the generation of a whole bunch of young black Americans. I was there in 92 with my X chain around my neck and with my X hat on. This man and this movie were cultural phenomenons. And whether you saw the movie a hundred times or just one time, you know the classic quote, quote, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock land. You saw the movie. Ah, but there was something that this man said in 1964. He was at the Organization of African American Unity, and he said these words, to fight whoever gets in our way, to bring about the complete independence of people of African descent here in the Western Hemisphere and first here in the United States, and bring about the freedom of these people by any means You've heard the quote, that's our motto. We want by any means necessary freedom. We want justice by any means necessary. We want equality by any means necessary. That phrase, that phrase, it was actually borrowed by a French philosopher and playwright, Jean-Paul Sartre. The first time it was actually used in popular culture though, Malcolm said it. And those words served as a battle cry that talked about people being fed up with their condition. They were no longer satisfied with their current circumstances and decided it was time for a change. This phrase actually set the stage for an unprecedented journey towards true emancipation and wholeness by any means necessary. It's an affirmation of one's willingness to do whatever it took to save yourselves from the suffering you've been enduring century after century after century. In the text, in the text, we find Jesus in Capernaum. He's in a home and he's preaching and teaching. And if I could use my holy imagination, if he was anywhere around my block, they were in the kitchen, in the living room, on the floor, in the window sills, and probably even standing out in the street. The word was out on this Jesus. He was the real deal. Folks said he must be Messiah material. He, he had power like no man had ever seen before, and he preached like no man had ever heard before. This same Jesus who in Mark 1 had already healed the leopard, cast out demons, and was even tempted by the devil. But when we land in Mark 2, 
we witness a compelling scene and a great encounter. It's a paralyzed man who could no longer fend for himself. We don't know much about the brother, but he's only noted in context as a paralytic or just him. We don't know the name of his condition, but we do see the consequences of his condition. He wasn't able to walk, and one could assume unable to take care of his own personal needs. Imagine his heartache when he watched his own limitations as he witnessed everyone else having the life that they have. Wanting to be normal, but not having the ability to experience that normalcy and being carried around and most likely cared for by the four of them. I think it's safe for us this morning to surmise this, that this brother was in emotional and physical bondage. He was enslaved to an infirmity and a society that could not offer him the very basic needs and desires of his heart. I, I wonder if he said to the brothers carrying him, take me to that house by any means necessary. There's no doubt he had heard about Jesus, but the closer he got, the more hope he probably got. But even with all the effort that it took to get there, it still wasn't good enough. Somebody this morning understands the paralytic's predicament right now. You're standing on the sideline watching everybody else get blessed. You're sitting as a spectator dreaming about a breakthrough, but there's too many obstacles standing in your way. You got a cancer diagnosis with a grim prognosis. You lost your job and don't have any finances to maintain your family's lifestyle. You got dreams but no education to get done what you want to get done. You're living single and waiting on that man or woman to come with no profit in sight. You're married and you're going through the motions, looking good on the outside with no intimacy on the inside. Alpha Street, somebody is paralyzed in the house this morning. You want deliverance, you want a blessing, you want freedom from your situation by any means necessary. You see, there are times in life that we face the most daunting obstacles and are so overcome by our challenges, we believe there's no way to fulfill God's purpose in our life. It is during these times that we must remember that no matter the trial, no matter the tribulation, you should stay steadfast in your faith, come face to face with your God, and live the life you have been destined to live. Church, church, the, the, the text, the text is leading us to ask a very pertinent question during this hour of power. What must we do? to ensure that we personally encounter God's intended promise and purpose for our lives. The first thing we have to do is, you gotta see past your circumstances. Come on to verse four, the text gives it to us, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and lowering the mat the man was lying on. The text is challenging us and it gives us a great model of what it means to have a faith and a willingness to see past your circumstances. Everybody knew in the block that Jesus had been healing and delivering all over the place. And this was the prime opportunity to get in front of the man that could heal me. But he and his friends literally walked up and were facing a crowd of people and his paralysis. The easy thing to do was to just give up. This is just too hard. I mean, there's, there's no way we can get you to Jesus. But here's the big lesson in the text. It doesn't matter what's in front of you. You got to focus on what's ordained for you. The, the, the paralytic circumstance didn't overshadow this ultimate purpose of getting him to Jesus. You see, when you get to the lowest point in your life, there's got to be something on the inside that pushes you to decide that today is the last day that what's in front of me is going to stop me. Today is the last day that I choose to let the past hinder me. There's got to be something for me, and God has it, so I believe. And then this is the kind of faith that it takes for us to see past our circumstances. It's a by any means necessary faith. It's the, it's the kind of faith that it takes us to see that you no longer look at a boundary as a boundary. It's a faith that looks at an obstacle like an opportunity. Now, now, I'm, I'm, I'm honest in church. You can't lie in church. That's what they should tell me. You can't lie in church. And the real problem with this is that it is very difficult for the body of Christ to see past their circumstances. I mean, how so? And we're going to take off our holy hats. It's 10 o'clock. You can kind of loosen up take off your holy hat. We've been committing idolatry. 
It's okay, you know, it's okay. I, I knew it wasn't going to be cool, but we have. Idolatry, you, you've been putting your pains and your problems and your purse strings in front of your purpose for Jesus. You, you, you got trials in your life and they've overcome you and they've affected your ability to actually function because you're so caught up in what's happening to you. That's a new God in your life. Siobhan, you don't understand. You don't, you don't understand. I'm, I'm going through something. My trust has been shattered. I'm living paycheck to ch paycheck. I'm dealing with the abuser. I'm an addict. He said he loved me, but he still won't marry me. The infidelity is more than I can take. My significant other ain't really that significant anymore. My boss won't let up on me. The cops are killing my babies. The retaliation against the cops are tearing up our communities. The hate rhetoric in our country is dividing us. I don't know what to do. But beloved, hear me. Your circumstances today are not designed to just break you. They're designed to rebuild you and broaden your capacity for tomorrow's blessing. See, when, when you're able to see past your circumstances, you're proving God's power in your life. Now, let, me, let me say this way. I'm, I'm the wife, daughter, and sister of three golfers gone wild. If Tiger Woods doesn't get out my house, three golfers gone wild, and if they could golf every single day of every single week, they would. The, the game of golf, it actually reminds me of what we're faced with in life. There are many obstacles actually in front of a golfer before they can get that ball into this one little, small, little, teeny, weeny hole. Golfers will tell you that the most beautiful golf courses give you the most hell. Mm-hmm. The manicured grass, the beautiful sands and the waterways, that means there's a sure sign, there's a battle right in front of you. Church, we live in our lives like that little white golf ball every single day. You getting knocked around, getting hit hard all over the place, you're falling in sand traps and even getting dunked in the water depending on who's swinging on you. <laughs> but even in the midst of those challenges, there's a hope in knowing that these obstacles, they're actually just temporary. Sooner or later, you're going to get to your desired destination. Somebody's got to hear that this morning. You will make it to the green into that little hole. I promise you. I promise you. God's purpose for your life is worth the hits. God's plan for your life is worth the pain. God's intentions for your destiny are worth the wait. Hold fast and stand firm and choose to see past your circumstances. I, I got to move on. I don't know. I gotta, you got to move on. But in order to see and encounter God's intended purpose and promise for your life, you've got to select your support system wisely. Mm -hmm. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, I'm in four, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat the man was lying on. C5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. The, the people around you, church, that you choose to associate yourself with, they can serve as a catalyst to your change or a hindrance to your healing. Yeah, yeah. Some of you are paralyzed with people right now. You got folk around you either adding to your paralysis or they're robbing you of your possessions. What possessions are they, preacher? Well, your joy, your peace, your finances, your body, your time, your health, you. Take the time, brothers and sisters, to ask yourself a tough question. Are the people around me pushing me to Jesus? Or are they pushing me over the edge? Yeah, yeah. If, we, if we're going to encounter God, his intended purpose for your life, then only a few folk can hang in that corner with you. I, I, I'm just going to say it. You can't roll with everybody when you want to encounter God's intended purpose for your life. I mean, you got your family. You got your friends. How many of us have him? And then you got your fans, your fans, your fans, not your fans, your fans, your fans. Those are people that, that love you when you're winning and disown you when you're down. That's another sermon, another Sunday. But I'm, I'm going to tell you this. When I prepared for this sermon, 
it actually helped me understand this concept a little better. I was studying the text in Mark 2, and I had to spend time in the other synoptic gospels, specifically in Matthew 9 and in Luke chapter 5. What I discovered was that the description of the four men in the other text did not detail the same way. Matthew noted that some men brought him to Jesus, and they, honored, they were honored for their faith. Luke gives us a little more perspective about their persistence, carrying him up on the roof and then moving through some towels to get him to Jesus. But then I concluded this, that Mark chapter 2 is the best depiction of the importance of selecting a support system wisely. If you look at the text, the men, the men, they did more than just climb up on the roof. When they got up there, they began digging a hole so they could lower him. And this is really profound, and I'm gonna tell you why. Scholars who have been studying architecture for years noted that many of the homes in those times, they were actually two stories. What they can't agree on is the height of the buildings. But one thing they do agree on is the architecture and materials used to build the buildings. It's the roof in those days that were constructed from beams covered with branches and mud. And that's it. Branches and mud. And think about what it took to get a paralyzed man up a ladder. Now, for those of you who understand paralysis, it is loss of use of your limbs. And when you have loss of use for your limbs, your weight becomes a little more dense. And, and they, they call that dead weight. They call that dead weight. And so the heavier the weight, the harder it is to move you from position to position to position. And when they got him up the ladder, think about what it meant to dig through some mud and branches just to get their homie to Jesus. Put it on the table, church. No one is talking about the danger they put themselves in. Because mud and branches are not necessarily the strongest elements to stand on. When you stand on mud, you begin to sink. When your heavy person or any individual stands on a branch, the branch breaks. Now hold right there. It's assessment time. And I need to ask you this. Have you taken inventory on your support system? Do you have a support system that will stand in harm's way just to get you to your blessing? Do you have a support system that knows how to get down and dirty with you and for you? Newsflash, when you are really going through something, the revelation will come about who your support system really is. You, you see, encountering God's purpose for your life, it's gonna cost you some people. And when you are self-assessing, you need to start that good old-fashioned process of elimination. Yeah, you, I use it on the SAT. I don't know about anybody else. Sometimes I just didn't know. A, D, C, process of elimination. And it's time to sift through the drama and conclude that my path to Jesus can't accommodate everybody. When you complete your elimination process, it might help you to actually document this process. Your resignation letter, you gotta, you gotta write a resignation letter, you gotta resign. And I took the liberty this morning to help you with your letter. Greetings. <laughs> to whom it may concern. It is with mixed emotions that I inform you that I will no longer be affiliated with this relationship. My time with you has been enlightening and even rewarding. However, I'm on my way to my healing, and I need to make room for those people that will carry me and get down and dirty with me so I may reach my divine destination through Christ Jesus by any means necessary. My favorite part, I pray God's blessings over you and your family. Signed, it's not personal, it's just business. Are there any ink pens in the house this morning? If you got people around you that don't tell you the truth, take your pen out. If you got people around you that won't tell you you're wrong, take your pen out. If you got people that won't lift you up when you're down, get your pen out. If the people are too good to get dirty with you and for you and pray you through, take your pen out. And newsflash, if you're thinking about somebody right now, go ahead and take your pen out. The problem, the problem is, you're personally appointing people that have no assignments in your life. They look the part. They sound the part. But what they do don't line up with what they say. They don't even understand that in Mark 2, you've got a plan and a model for the Mark chapter 2 support system. Nothing stopped these men. They pushed past everything in front of them just so he could get to Jesus. And here's the thing. 
they didn't care about the dirt or the danger. That's the kind of friends I want. For those of us that ride the metro, I want somebody to see something and say something. Uh-huh, that's all right. I mean, I ride the metro, so every day she says that. See something, say something. I'm closing. Not only must you see past your circumstances and, and select your support system wisely, but in order to experience God's intended purpose for your life, you have to cease every opportunity to obey his commands and praise his name. It's, it's, it's our power, and I really don't have that much time, so the Lord wouldn't let me go on this non-negotiable lesson, though. So Jesus saw their faith, and there were some haters I mean, Pharisees in the room <laughs> questioning Jesus' power to heal and to forgive. If you don't remember anything I said, remember this. God puts faithful people in position to praise him because he blesses them for the whole world to see. Here, here it is. Obedience packaged with praise is kryptonite to predicaments and doubting people. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, a, that's a shout in the text because the paralyzed man who had no physical capacity to move, as soon as his friends made an effort, and as soon as they all displayed their faith, he would get up, take up his mat, and go home for the whole world to see. Now, there are a number of commentaries that suggest that sin was the sole reason that this man was paralyzed. And I believe there might be a little bit of validity to sin, but I dare to say that sometimes it's not just about your sin. Sometimes it's just life. Sometimes it's about you going through a process. So when you obey God and you praise God by any means necessary, the things that have you paralyzed can't hold you no more. Those problems, those peoples, those predicaments, the sin in your life, it doesn't have the power over you because now you're covered. Now you've been touched. Now you are blessed. And now your destiny moment is upon you. I I'm going to say it this way. I, I travel a lot for work. I do. I travel a lot for work. American Airlines and I have a really close relationship. And so much so that when I go to the security line, people say, hey, you're back again. I'm like, oh, I fly way too much. And a while back, I was actually heading out on a business trip, and I received my normal upgrade because of my frequent flying. Now, when your status changes on an airline, you're actually able to enter into an expedited preferred line. This particular day, though, I wasn't wearing my business suit. I was rocking my Nikes and my sweats. Because when you fly a lot, you know you got to take your clothes off and put them back on just to go through security. So that particular day, I walked into the preferred line. And the stairs started coming. <laughs> you know, you know exact. And here's the bad thing about this. The person that was staring was a TSA agent. So I looked back at her. <laughs> and then she did it. Excuse me. This line is for first class. <laughs> from Camden, I'm from Camden, from Camden. I was thinking, you froggy jump. Like, what, what do you, what? What do you, what? I was fuming. I was so upset. And here's what's interesting. The people behind me were mad too because they actually had a chance to witness what happening, what was happening. And so I was thinking to myself, God, you're a God of grace and mercy. If I bust her in the head, you'll forgive me in the end. It's just, Lord, I ask for forgiveness. And so, so the line next to me though was the preferred pre-check line. And for those of you that fly a lot, you know what pre-check is. Pre-check is the lane that you're clear to actually walk all the way through because you've gone through a process to become eligible for that benefit. And that gives you a more convenient travel experience. So, so I let Miss Stang know that I am flying first class. And then she scanned my ticket. That thing started beeping a little different. And I was thinking, oh, did I do something? Did, it, did I? I, I, that's all I can think about. And immediately, I saw her countenance change because the lead TS agent was on her way walking over to us. Then I was like, oh, man, my daddy going to kill me. I don't even know what I did. 
I just want to go to this plane. And so the woman that came over was the sister. And there's something about that connection when you walk up on somebody like. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's about, something about to happen to either me or her. And so she walked up to me and she said, ma'am, I saw what happened. And I wanted to let you know that you are now eligible for the preferred benefit of the pre-check line. And you actually don't have to stand this line. Let's just walk in front of these people and you follow me all the way to the front of the security. So I look back at that Pharisee. Oh, I saw, yeah, I did it. And here's the cool part. The cool part is this. All the people that were angry with me, that were carrying their anger with me, they were high-fiving me all the way up to the front of the line. I don't know who that's for this morning, but when you decide to stick to God's plan, when you decide to trust and obey him, when you decide that nothing can deter me, when you decide that what he's got for me is for me, I guarantee you in the end, you're going to have a reason to praise him. When God delivers you, the people are going to see you. When God delivers you, the haters are going to see you. When God delivers you, the wayward people will see you. And when God delivers you, your ex is going to see you too. The world will have no choice to say, what is this? I am amazed at what God has done because we know the journeys in our life are hard. We know the sacrifices and he knows the pain. But the God I serve is the God of faithfulness, a God of justice, a God of redemption, a God of grace, and a God of mercy. You encounter God's promises by seeing past your circumstances, by selecting your support system wisely, and never seizing the opportunity to obey his command and bless his name. Never, ever forget that you need God by any means necessary.